Welcome to the first presentation in our 2010-2011 Millennium Lecture Series. We are delighted that you've joined us today. The theme of this year's Millennium Lecture Series is issues in U.S. public higher education. We've invited a group of distinguished speakers to share with us their perspectives on such issues as closing educational achievement gaps across demographic groups, preparing a competitive 21st century workforce, serving as a catalyst for economic development, and developing more sustainable funding models for higher education in the public sector. We have a very, very special kickoff speaker today. We couldn't have asked for, frankly, a more exciting representative of the interests of higher education than the Honorable Ruben Hinojosa, U.S. Representative of the 15th District of Texas, stretching from the Rio Grande Valley to historic Goliad County and the Coastal Bend region of Texas. Elected in 1996 and currently serving his seventh term, Congressman Hinojosa is the chairman of the U.S. House Subcommittee on Higher Education lifelong learning, and competitiveness. The Congressman is widely recognized as a true champion for the disadvantaged and a strong voice for communities traditionally underserved by America's educational system, including low-income and minority students, English language learners, the disabled, and children of migrant and seasonal agricultural workers. He is committed to seeing that every child graduates prepared for and with access to a college education. Hispanic serving institutions like UTEP are truly indebted to Congressman Hinojosa for many legislative successes, beginning with the establishment in 1998 of a separate title of the Higher Education Act for Hispanic Serving Institution Development. In the intervening 12 years, funding for Hispanic serving institutions has grown from $12 million to nearly $95 million. Since his appointment as chairman of the Subcommittee on Higher Education, Lifelong Learning and Competitiveness, Congressman Hinojosa counts among major successes the landmark allocation of $510 million to minority institutions and a new program to support graduate degree attainment at Hispanic serving institutions. He also joined President Barack Obama in signing the Reconciliation Act of 2010, which invests $2.55 billion in minority serving institutions, representing the single largest increase in student financial aid since the GI Bill was signed in 1945. Congressman Hinojosa holds a bachelor's degree in business administration from the University of Texas at Austin and a master's in business administration from the University of Texas Pan American in Edinburgh. Before his election, Congressman Hinojosa ran his family's food processing company, H&H &H Foods, as president and chief financial officer for 20 years. Congressman Hinojosa also has had an enormous impact on education in South Texas through his service, not only in developing a community college and doing all kinds of other things, but he served on the Texas State Board of Education for many, many years in Texas. This is a true believer in education, a true advocate for those for whom education is most important, and I am so delighted to introduce to you and welcome to the UTEP campus, Congressman Ruben Hinojosa. President Natalicio, thank you so very much for that very generous and wonderful introduction makes me feel very proud to be on your campus, to have been invited by Congressman Silvestre Reyes 
to get here Wednesday and be able to participate in many things that are happening in El Paso and the surrounding area. It is indeed an honor to uh, be here on the campus of University of Texas Pan uh, at El Paso because I have seen so much growth since I was here six years ago. I asked uh, Dr. Natalicio, I saw some cranes, I saw some construction going on. Do you have a building or two under construction? She says, no, we have four. <laughs> she thinks big, but more than anything, she is one of the visionaries that come to my office in Washington from time to time and tell me what is happening in the world of higher education and what her concerns are. And I will never forget when I was, uh, I was elected amongst my, my peers, there's 50 members on the education committee, and they elected me to be the chairman of that subcommittee on higher education. And she was one of the first ones to come visit me and congratulate me. And I asked her, I said, uh, thank you for all those nice things you've said, but uh, tell me, what are your highest priorities? What could I do as the chairman of the subcommittee on higher ed to help you out? And she says, Congressman, it's very simple. It's uh, affordability, accessibility of higher education. The Texas legislature has cut us significantly. It used to be that we received 60% of our budget from the legislature, and that's down to less than 30%. And with those kinds of cuts, we have no choice but to raise the tuition fees, and many from low middle income families, hardworking families can't afford it. So take a look at the Pell Grant. It seems that it has hovered for about six years under this administration, uh, and this administration was run by Bush, that uh, it has hovered at three to 3,500. And with the increases that we, uh, ask the students to pay, many can't make it. So I said, well, how do you think that um, I should uh, approach that problem? He says, well, that's why we sent you to Congress <laughs> to see how you could do it. So I said, well, I'll tell you this. I will focus on that. I will add the words that you just used on many of my speeches and remarks <clears throat> that I make in different, uh, in different states where I go speak. And that is that I am working on accessibility and affordability of higher education for all students. Dr. Natalicio is an extraordinary leader with a tremendous commitment to academic excellence, access and equity and as you know, she is recognized nationally as a champion for STEM education through her work with the National Science Board. STEM, the acronym for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. Most of all, she is someone who works tirelessly to ensure that our students achieve their greatest potential. We are extremely fortunate to have Dr. Natalicio at the helm of this fine institution of higher learning that you call UTEP. I also want to acknowledge those of you in the audience, particularly two state representatives who are here. Would you please stand and let us recognize you, state representatives from El Paso. I think that we are fortunate to have young men and women who are now the leaders of our legislature and many others that I met here in El Paso in the judiciary and city council and many other positions. I am amazed at so many great leaders that you have 
and I'm sure that many have gone through this system here at UTEP. We know that those students who do not acquire at least two years of a college education will be a serious in a serious disadvantage and unable to access high-skilled, family-sustaining jobs in our economy. During the economic recession, which I believe started at the end of 2007, but wasn't officially declared until much later, individuals without a high school or college diploma have experienced much higher unemployment rates. Think about it. Which are the sectors that got hit hardest? Construction, construction of uh, residential homes and commercial buildings and some of the roads. Who builds those? In most cases, they are minority populations, mostly Hispanic. And they took a big hit very quickly. Their employment rates went as high as 15, 16, and 20 percent. According to the U.S. Department of Labor, the unemployment rate in our civilian labor force was 13.8% for persons 25 and over with less than a high school diploma as of July of this year. In contrast, the unemployment rate for persons with a bachelor's degree was only 4.5%, substantially lower than the unemployment rate for our least educated workers. Education is clearly the economic issue of our time. I came to Armendariz Middle School and I spoke to children in that wonderful school and I told them that I had two messages for them yesterday, together with Congressman Reyes, and that was the importance of volunteering to do something for their community, for their school, at home, building uh, gardens, uh, vegetable gardens, if possible, in their home or their school, uh, helping pick up the trash around a campus, watching adults who are helping paint homes for senior citizens. And I listed about eight or ten different things that are being done this month of September in remembrance of 9-11 for those who responded responded quickly to help those Twin Towers that were coming down and the many people, the 3,000 people we lost. And it made a big impression on them. And I said, and the, second, the second message that I bring to you is that I want you to make education your highest priority. And I told them some of the things that you just heard me talk about. And so I am glad that I am invited to this lecture series to talk about education and the importance of literacy because that is the foundation of education. That is where the art of learning starts, early reading and early writing to be able to be successful in school. For the past several years, I've worked closely with Chairman George Miller from California, who is chairman of the Committee of the Whole and other colleagues on the Education and Labor Committee to make college more accessible and affordable. And I believe that I'm going to show you how we have succeeded where others before me were not able to do it. I think out of the box, and I come from a generation of junior JCs that joined the Junior Chamber of Commerce, and they taught me something very early at 21, just gotten out of the University of Texas, uh, in uh, Austin at that age, and I heard JCs don't know it can't be done. And that's why we participate and help the community. And that attitude I've taken through life as an adult, young adult and a senior adult, that I don't know it can't be done. And oftentimes I would have to have an extra hour to tell you how many naysayers said that I could not start a community college in my area that I could not start a magnet high school system, that I could not raise the Pell Grant, that I could not put the $2.55 billion for minority serving institutions because it had never been done before. 
On March the 30th, 2010, I had the unique opportunity of joining President Obama on the signing of the Health Care and Education Reconciliation Act of 2010. I received a phone call from President Obama, his chief of staff. It was 6.30 in the afternoon on Sunday. My wife was preparing something to eat, dinner, and my two daughters were helping her. And they could hear that my conversation was with somebody in the White House. And the question was, Congressman, can President Obama call you about 8 or 9 o'clock tonight on this particular phone? Happened to be my, my cell phone that I carry on me since 9-11. I said, of course he can call me anytime he wants to. Doesn't have to be between 8 and 9. <laughs> and my girls heard. And I hung up and Karen, the youngest one of my five children, said, Dad, tell us what's going on said, President Obama is going to call between 8 and 9 if he can. And I have no idea what he's going to ask me. So they are the fastest text senders that there are. <laughs> and they got on their, on their little telephones and they text 1,500 Cooper Middle School students and the other one, 2,000 Langley High School students and said, President of the United States is calling my father tonight, <laughs> short. And sure enough, he called that evening just before nine. He says, Ruben, I called to thank you, to thank you for your leadership and your tenacity to see to it that minority serving institutions will get 2.55 billion over the next 10 years. And the HSIs like you have in your district and down in South Texas, will be competing for 100 million additional dollars over what they get now from the Department of Education, which the biography that President Natalicio read from, it was at 95,000, but today is at 137 million, not 1,000, but 137 million a year, plus this 100 million that starts October 1, 2010 for $237 million a year. And it's mandatory because it's in the law. We don't have to go beg for it every year and afraid that the president will cut 5% or 10%. It's mandatory. And so that is going to open the opportunities for many, many more students who attend the 200 HSIs we have in our country and the territories. But that's not all. In that bill, it has a direct government loan program where we used to guarantee the bonds for Sally May and for City Group to lend to students college loans at a rate of 85 to 12%. The direct government loans will be 45 to 5.5%. And instead of having to pay back at I believe it used to be 15% is going to be dropped to 10% of their net pay. But if you go to areas that need your service as a professor, as a teacher, or other uh, specialties, we will forgive, give you a forgiveness program that we forgive 25% of your loan each year. And within four to five years, it'll be paid for. It has a new way of applying for a government loan that instead of having 10 or 12 pages to fill out the form, it only has two pages. It's unbelievable. It matches your family's IRS income tax return so that it all has to square, but simply two pages. And so all I can tell you is I have served under Bill Clinton and under George Bush, and I've served now a year and a half under President Obama. And all of them said they wanted to be the education president and be remembered as such. But how could they do that when they never really put money into it? This president called us approximately a month ago, 
before we went out of session uh, in August and said, we're going to have to make some serious cuts to our budget. And he gave percentages that he had given his own secretaries in the cabinet to make cuts in their budget. He said, with the exception of the Department of Defense, with the exception of Homeland Security for our national security, and with the exception of education, I almost fell out of my chair. No other president had ever said that. And when you take a look at what has been invested in the different acts that I may mention by name, you can, you can see why Arne Duncan, Secretary of Education, said this legislation is a big, big deal because it exceeds the GI Bill of 1944. And you know that we went into a period of prosperity after the World War II because we sent so many, many veterans and folks who had fought for us, for our, for our freedom, sent them to college. So, folks, I am here to tell you that big changes have been made under this administration in education and health care and helping women move up in how much they're paid instead of having a huge difference between what we pay the men and what we pay the women. Forget what the title is of that particular piece of legislation, but I can tell you that women had been neglected for far too long, and that type of legislation was greatly received by the American public. More affordable student loans through the government's direct loan program and investments of $36 billion in the Pell Grant scholarships will definitely help this affordability and accessibility. As you know, there are thousands of underrepresented and low-income students who are discouraged from considering post-secondary education. That means working on their masters and working on their doctoral programs. Well, let me say, we, in my opinion, must provide students with the most accurate information and counseling so that students can access and attain a college degree beyond an associate degree, beyond a bachelor's degree, because we need to train individuals with masters so that they can go teach where it is required to have a masters, such as at the community college for the academic programs. And we need more with a PhD because many of those who were lucky enough to get and earn a doctorate degree are close to retirement. And so I'm delighted that I am in a position where I can promote higher education, especially with the extra funding that this administration is giving us. The Historic Health Care and Education Reconciliation Act also included $2 billion investments to strengthen our nation's community colleges. And that had never been done before. And I have lots of friends in the community college, like Dr. Shirley Reed, who is the president of South Texas College down in, in the Rio Grande Valley, with four campuses and 28,000 students, and how happy they are that I, as the chairman, would introduce that type of legislation added to the Reconciliation Bill. Because, in my opinion, they are working closely with the universities so that if, they, if the university produces an engineer, the community college can give us two technicians to help that engineer. And it's just amazing at how many associate degree nurses they have produced. And all I can say is, I love this legislation. The federal funding will allow minority serving institutions to expand their capacity to educate greater numbers of students and move us closer to building a world-class higher education system for all students. In Congress, we have also made significant strides in bolstering and expanding graduate education. The reauthorization of higher ed 
has what we call the Higher Education Opportunity Act, H-E-O-A, that was passed in 2008, including the authorization of a new federal program for HSIs, the Promoting Post-Baccalaureate Opportunities for Hispanic Americans grant program, also known as Title V, Part B. When I got to Congress in 1997, HSIs had been created five or six years before, authorized with 25, I believe it was authorized with a, a, a maximum of $25 million. They were zero funded by the appropriators for three years in a row after it, was, it, after it passed. And then the fourth and fifth year, they gave us $10 million for 200 HSIs. And I got there and I told my chief of staff, this must be a mistake, it must be a, uh, an error, a typing error. Maybe it's 100 million because the HBCUs were getting 109 million. She said, no, no, they were zero funded for three years and we're lucky to have 10 and $12 million now these last two years. I said, well, we're gonna do something about that. And I first created a new section in the, in the education code known as Title V, HSIs. I wanted to take them out of the title that they were in with other 600 colleges and universities throughout the country and raise the level of awareness that these colleges were doing a great job in bringing Hispanic students to study because two thirds of them go to HSIs like UT El Paso and UT uh, Pan American and uh, UT Brownsville, all over the country. And sure enough, it passed. But this time now that I'm chairman, I said, I want to expand Title V Part A and create, I wrote the legislation for Part B for postgraduate studies. And sure enough, I persuaded the 50 members of that committee to approve it, and it is now law. And that's why I wanted the funding so that we could move that forward. I'm proud to say that the reauthorization of HEOA also provided mandatory funding to begin implementing this new initiative to strengthen graduate programs at HSIs like UTEP. In fiscal year 2010, Title V Part B received $22 million to get it started. It's a big difference than when they started back in 1996. And we're going to raise that because under the new $100 million, there will be monies that can also go to the postgraduate programs. While earning a college degree opens the doors of opportunity for thousands of students each and every year, we must also encourage our undergraduates to further their studies and consider both the master's and the PhD programs. And I'm proud to say that I heard today that UT has 60 students in the doctoral program. Give them a big round of applause if they're here. In July, of this year, the National Center for Education Statistics released a report entitled Status and Trends in the Education of Racial and Ethnic Groups. The report indicated that in 2008, graduate school enrollment for Latino students was 6.2%, that 11.5% for African Americans, and that it was half of 1% for American Indians and Alaska Natives, as well as 7% for Asian and Pacific Islanders. Similarly, the National Science Foundation's 2008 biennial report to Congress on broadening participation in America's STEM workforce found that STEM doctoral degrees awarded to Hispanics in 2005 was only 2.6%. It was 2.3% for African Americans and two tenths of 1% for American Indian, and it was 4% for Asian and Pacific Islanders. We need those numbers to move to 10% as soon as possible, and that's what I'm going to work on. 
In addition, only 2.3% of Mexican Americans and 2.1% of Puerto Ricans and 6.5% of African Americans graduated from U.S. medical schools in the year 2008-2009, according to the Association of American Medical Colleges. We need more doctors. We need more nurses. We need more physicians, assistants. We need more allied health folks because we had so many people who were uninsured and now under this new health plan in my area, which had 40% uninsured men and women, that is going to drop to about 12 or 13% who are uninsured. Naturally, as more people have insurance, they will be coming to, to, to see doctors and, and going to the hospitals and so forth. And so who is going to take care of them if we don't focus on producing more graduates in that sector of healthcare? I believe that we will see significant progress in this area over the next decade, over the next decade with the enactment of the Healthcare and Education Reconciliation Act and the Higher Education Opportunity Act. As our nation makes these long-term investments in higher ed, I applaud President Obama and Secretary Arne Duncan for calling on our nation's schools and colleges and universities to prepare all students to be college and career ready and to increase college access, persistence and completion, because many start but don't finish and we need to turn that around. President Obama's goal of having our nation lead the world in its proportion of college graduates by the year 2020 is laudable. However, America must work harder and be more strategic to restore its reputation as a world leader in post-secondary attainment. In the college board study entitled the College Completion Agenda 2010 Progress Report, the United States ranked 12th, yes, I said 12th, in post-secondary attainment when compared to other developed nations. Among adults between the ages of 25 to 34 who had earned an associate degree in 2007, America trailed behind Canada, behind South Korea, behind the Russian Federation, Japan, New Zealand, Ireland, Norway, Israel, France, and Australia. We can't let that happen anymore. I believe that first and foremost, we must ensure that greater numbers of students cross the finish line on graduation day. The College Board study found that as of 2007, only 28% of students across the nation who enter college with the intention of earning an associate degree persist to graduation in three or less years. For those students seeking a bachelor's degree in six years or less, the national average is 56%. We must improve that. For, min for minority students, the outcomes are much worse. For example, as of 2007, only 18% of associate degree seeking Latino students, 26% of associate degree seeking African American students, and 21% of American Indian students persist to graduation. I was sad to see that in Texas, as of 2007, only 16% of associate degree seeking Latino students made it to the graduation day. These findings should be of great concern to all of us. Through bold and courageous leadership, I am confident that our nation's institutions of higher learning can meet the president's goals and once again 
lead the world in post-secondary attainment. America has one of the most comprehensive and accessible higher ed systems in the entire world. Every year, chancellors, faculty, students, researchers from across the globe visit our post-secondary institutions to examine and learn from their best practices and innovation. I have no doubt that our colleges and research universities, like University of Texas El Paso, will continue to be the envy of the world if we increase graduation rates and prepare a highly skilled and well-educated workforce to meet the vast challenges of the 21st century. I have met with so many representatives of all of the sectors of education, elementary, middle school, high school, the community college and the universities. And I am so impressed that you all are hitting the head on the nail when it comes to investing in literacy for early, early education. And that you all have found ways in which to increase the graduation rate of your high school students from 55% to 75%. And I'm going to take back the plan and the program that is being implemented here in El Paso because that's something that I want to see if we can implement regionally and then nationally. Issues of climate change, renewable energy, the amelioration of poverty, increasing literacy at all levels, and finding the cure for cancer and other fatal diseases that can rob us from our loved ones way, way too soon are just some of the most pressing issues of our time. And as we look to the future, we must remember that we live in a complex, diverse and technologically advancing world. Why is it that we don't have more fiber optic lines and more internet connections so that more children will have computers and be able to have rapid response when they turn it on or look up information or do an inquiry? More than ever, it is imperative there are institutions of higher learning train women and men of all ages to tackle some of those most vexing problems that lie ahead. It is vitally important that our nation's colleges and universities serve as beacons of academic excellence and human development for all students regardless of their income. It is critical that they foster and promote intellectual growth, critical thinking and innovation, exceptional teaching and learning, groundbreaking research and scientific discovery, service and civic participation, as well as a strong commitment to equity and diversity. Again, I say to you, you have an extraordinary president. She has moved UTEP to number four in the state of Texas in terms of the amount of research money that has been brought to a university. Only Texas A&M, University of Texas, Austin, and University of Texas Arlington are higher than UTEP. And she has single-handedly gotten that done because she is a member of the National Science Foundation because she knows how to write those applications. She knows what it takes to be able to win on a competitive basis those millions and millions of dollars that we need for research because that's how we develop hardware and software. That's how we develop research that is going to solve the cancer problem. That is how we are able to make businesses be able to have a quick turnaround when they have an idea of manufacturing a, a, a widget and be able to do it and at a cost that lets us compare with China and with India 
and other countries that have such low uh, labor wages. Today, students and workers must be able to analyze and decipher information. They must be able to be catalysts for change and ingenuity. They must think out of the box. They must not let people say that they're satisfied with status quo. Those were the words of President Natalicio just before I walked in to this auditorium. And I'm repeating them because that's exactly how I think. That's what I tell members of my committee, that we cannot, we cannot continue with status quo. Finally, I want to say that there is room for UTEP to continue to expand their international studies because you have a population that in most cases is bilingual and that they can learn a third and a fourth and a fifth language. Those efforts are being made. I went to do a congressional hearing in Ohio State University and to my surprise they have 58 languages being taught there. It's the best recruiting recruiting university for the State Department. And I want to change that. I want our area to be able to offer many, many more languages and prepare our students so that they can get those good paying jobs in the State Department and in the CIA and all the different federal agencies that I have become acquainted with where they are required to speak the languages of whatever country they are sent to. In closing, I would like to underscore once again President Obama's urgent call to our nation on August the 9th, education is the economic issue of our time. We have a mandate and a responsibility to educate and prepare as many of our youth and our adults as possible in this next 10 years. Our nation's future and global competitiveness depends on it. By building on our strength and making college accessibility and affordability and completion key priorities for our nation, I believe will get us there. It has been a pleasure addressing you today, and I hope that I am invited to come back sometime soon. Thank you. I want to thank Congressman Hinojosa for all of the wonderful information that he shared with us and for provoking a lot more thinking about ways in which we can move even more swiftly toward many of these goals. I also want to um, assure Congressman Hinojosa that all of that hard work writing proposals and getting all those grants is really everybody who's here. And so I want to acknowledge with thanks all the great work that everybody on this campus has done. Roberto Segueda, our Vice President for Research, told me that we submitted something like 570 proposals uh, this past year. And with all the running around I do, I confess I didn't write very many of those. <laughs> but you all did, and our success rate is really high. And, and it is that hard work and that commitment uh, that I so much appreciate from, from everyone here. This is a team and we appreciate all you do. Congressman Hinojosa has agreed to answer questions and so if you have questions or comments that you'd like to share with him, there are microphones um, in the aisles and I hope that you will avail yourself of them. Thank you very much for the information that uh, you gave us. Uh, to close the gap, um, obviously a good part of that is a numbers game. And if the amount of uh, people are not graduating high school, then they obviously can't make it after that. So, Basically, my question comes in is, 
how much money is being focused on the marketing to the mothers of the children, uh, let's say mothers from 20 to 40 years old, so they realize the importance of education. Is there a percentage of every bill that is passed that goes just to the marketing focusing on mothers understanding the value of education? That's a very good question, and I don't know that I can answer the amount of money, but I can tell you that um, in my trips to other countries that are beating us in the, in, in the what we call interest, the scholastic competition, eighth grade and twelfth grade, I learned in China and I learned in South Korea that um, early reading plus writing equals success in school. And this gentleman in China with a nice long beard, senior in age, I'm sure, said there is a thread that has to be added to this formula, and that's parental involvement. And I came back to my district, and I formed a coalition known as the South Texas Literacy Coalition, where there are three members of Congress, one to the east and one to the west. One is based in Laredo, the other one in Brownsville, and myself in Edinburgh, McAllen. And I said, let's form a coalition and invite every school between Laredo and Brownsville, and let's start the same kind of a program that they have in China and South Korea, where we start reading to the children from cradle to the sixth grade. If they don't learn how to read and have a good vocabulary and be able to write by the time they're in the sixth grade, it may be too late. Not that it can't be resolved or improved, but they do it so that a child can start reading when he's three years old and pecking on a computer when he's four years old. And I laid this out. I, I brought in 38 school district uh, superintendents and principals and other folks. It's big, really big. And I said, I have a partner, a partner by the acronym RIF, R-I-F. Reading is fundamental. And they give out books to children of participating schools. And it's important that children have these books so that they learn the art of learning by having that basic foundation of reading. And then that they write what they read in a paragraph or two or three, whatever. And uh, all this to say, I was sharing all of this at a uh, conference in Washington. And it was a large auditorium bigger than this. And when I finished my presentation as to what I was going to do to resolve the problem that was just brought forward by this gentleman, a woman came to the front and she says, I'm going to introduce myself. I'm the executive director of the Meadows Foundation and I want to be your partner. I said, great, we have to match the cost of these books under the RIF program that I just talked about. And Congress gives us 75% of the cost of these brand new books. The 25% we have to raise, and I'm asking uh, Fortune 500 companies to pitch in $25,000 so we can do the 25% match. And the bottom line is she said, I will take that to my board. She called me 10 days later and said, they don't want to give you 25000 They want to give you 150000 They think your idea is fabulous. But there's one condition. We want there to be parental involvement. And I thought I was listening to that Chinese gentleman who said there's a thread that has to run through this formula and this parental involvement. And you start reading to the child in the cradle. And before you know it, they do what I just said. And... She said, you'll find that most of those who get involved in the parental involvement will be female. They'll be mothers. Mothers who want their children to succeed in school and be able to go to college. And so 
I'm finding that the higher the education of the men, particularly college education, that they're more, more likely to go to these training programs where we teach a lot of our people how to read to children when they're that young, because that's not easy to do. But it's working, and I can tell you that I'm always open to ideas on how to close that gap. But if we start early, with early education, as I've just described to you, we can accomplish what the Chinese did in graduating 97% of those children in kindergarten all the way through high school, or the South Koreans who graduate 99% of those children who start in kindergarten and graduate. And this information is not in writing. I got that from the Minister of Education of those two countries. And I said, well, Mr. Minister of Education, how many of those graduates go to college? In China, it was 70%. And in South Korea, it was 80%. And let's look at the income per capita in China. It's less than $2,000 per person. A year. Not a week and not a month. A year. In South Korea, it's about $7,000. The economy in South Korea today has a 2% unemployment rate. And they're listed in the top 10 best nations or best countries to live in. So we're on the right track. I told the staff here at UTEP when we had lunch today, gosh, it's music to my ears to hear that your president is leading you on everything that I've heard in successful models that I have seen in the United States and in other countries. Because believe me, the United States doesn't, doesn't have this problem that I'm talking about everywhere. There are some regions where they're graduating 99% of all the students in that high school. So we want to duplicate that. And I think that the art of learning starts with that formula that was given to me. Is there another question? Uh, oh, sorry. Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to thank you, uh, Congressman uh, Inosa, uh, particularly for all the work that you've done and bringing education as a uh, pri uh, primary uh, issue mm -hmm. to Congress. Yes, sir. Um, I'm a member from this campus's uh, Young Adult Black, uh, Council, which is the League for United Latin American Citizens. And basically, I would like to um, ask. Uh, status update for the GMAT. Uh, how is that going to go work? What's the congressional agenda for that? I think I'm hard of hearing, but I don't understand the question. Uh, the Dream Act. Oh, the Dream Act. Yes. Okay, now I can hear you. Sorry. Okay. The Dream Act is one that will help children who came with their parents from another country at any age, could have been three, five, ten, and they are going to our school system, they graduate, and they are college material. Many are valedictorian, salutatorian, or top 10 or top 20 percentile, but because they don't have a social security number and so forth, they're not here legally documented, they can't get a student loan, they can't go to college. And so the DREAM Act was written, and it has a lot of support. But there's a much bigger picture that members of Congress, like myself, would like to resolve, and that is to have a comprehensive immigration reform act that will take people who are undocumented and get them registered and documented so that they don't have to be in the shadows moving from point A to point B and being picked up and sent back to their sending country. So if you pass and introduce DREAM Act as we have it written and will pass, two things will happen. There will be those who want agriculture folks to get some, some additional help, and they call that the AGD, AG Act. They want to let it ride together with the DREAM Act. Then we have those in information technology, 
like especially in Portland, Oregon, in Seattle, Washington, and the Northwest, who want special consideration for information technology for that sector. But it leaves out probably 10 million out of the 12 million who are undocumented. And we're coming closer and closer to some compromise. And we don't want to give up one little piece of the whole picture and forget the other 10 million. Because the country needs to settle this problem that we have today, which is very similar to what the Irish had back in the 1930s. And then the German American and Polish and Czech who came through Galveston into Texas and all over the country. Uh, they seem to be in history books uh, cycles of different uh, people who came from other lands because the United States is a country of immigrants. I personally am first generation American. My father and mother came one from Chihuahua, Chihuahua, my mother was five years old, a hundred years ago, went to McAllen. The revolution was on, 1910. Her family was all moved by uh, horse-drawn uh, horse carts all the way to McAllen because there were some relatives there. My father was nine years old. His father had gotten killed in the revolution. And my grandmother had four children. And she crossed on a ferry right close to Mission, Texas, which is a little town called Peñitas. And they settled there. Bottom line is this. I am a, a number eight out of 11 children of a marriage of this young girl from this region and this young man from close to Reynosa Diaz. And all 11 children graduated from high school. Half of us graduated from college and have masters. I have five children. And I tell the stories this to my five children. Three have now graduated from college. And the youngest two, 14 and 16, are college bound. They know where they want to go. They know what they want to study. So you see, there's a lot of opportunity of, of having immigrants continue to build our country and take us back into prosperity. So the DREAM Act is not going to be introduced alone because the other things will happen. Give us time and you'll see it. It will be a part of the package of, of comprehensive immigration reform. And Congressman Reyes and I are part of a unanimous group of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus who are going to continue to be the lead on that issue. That's a very good question. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, I should have. Uh, my name is Jonathan. I'm an undergraduate uh, teaching assistant here in the chemistry department. Uh, this summer, we did a program called the Bridge Program for Bridges High School. I'm not sure if you're aware of it. It's an income uh, high school here in the Eastside District. And um, what we did is we uh, performed a bridge camp by volunteer um, as a main organizer of it. What we did was a, a combination of sustainability projects in which um, the local kids went to uh, Sunday Park, which is a lake here in El Paso, they cleaned up. Um, they took uh, analysis of the water to go bacterial samples. They basically conducted their own experiments to basically increase the amount of science that they were exposed to. A lot of them didn't know how to collect the water samples or anything like that. My question to you is, um, as well as being a great learning experience for myself even volunteering this summer, it was a great learning experience for the students as well. Um, is there any plans in the future to increase the exposure of undergraduate students in the high schools to try and promote um, educational learning for those students who maybe start off college not wanting a career in education but then they're on the side that they do? I'm going to be honest with you. All the public schools have gotten cut by the Texas legislature, just like the community college and your university. I think that to start new programs might be difficult to ask a superintendent or a principal to start programs like that because of the funding. Uh, in the future, it has a strong possibility. I have time for one more question. Hi, um, I, I'm 
certainly thinking out of the box. Uh, I do not want to go back to the unbanked, okay, not in the bank, because putting the money under the mattress or putting it in a container and digging a hole and putting it in the, in the backyard or someplace uh, is not the best way. Uh, there's no question that the banking system was had a lot of problems because uh, even though there were regulations, they were not being enforced. I sit on the Financial Services Committee that oversees all the banks, all the equity investment companies, and uh, I'm very senior on that committee. I'm number 12 from the chairman out of 70 members on that committee. And because I have my education in, in, a, in business, BBA and MBA, I can really understand that, that committee very, very well. And you will remember in 2007 when uh, presidential candidate McCain, Senator McCain, would get up there and say, what we need is a smaller government and we need fewer employees in the government and stop butting into the businesses because the markets will take care of themselves. That was, those were his words. Well, that was September 2007 and in 2008, before the elections, no, that was 2007, 2008 now, um, I remember uh, Secretary of the Treasury Paulson coming to our committee on a Tuesday and saying that the government needed to pass legislation that would authorize $700 billion to bail out the financial system. Now, how could we have gone in one year from a very strong financial system and banking system to one that needed 700 billion, which is many times more than we gave GMC and Chrysler and all those other automotive uh, companies uh, 10, 20 years ago when we bailed them out. So we told him that it couldn't be done. He said he wanted it approved by Friday, that week. We said, well, if you don't, then we're going to see a financial disaster all over the country. And people are going to run to the banks to ask for their money, and they can only guarantee up to about 100000 if they fail. And I don't think that there will be enough money, liquidity, 
in the vaults to be able to pay everybody that has a bank account. By Wednesday of the following week, in 10 days, we had approved 700 billion. And then everything started to fall apart. So think back in history and everything that you've read and gone to museums and seen that a thousand, ten thousand years ago there were gold coins, some that came from Spain on the ships when they were looking to see if the, the world was round. There's always been an exchange in commerce with some kind of coins and dollars and hard and paper and so forth. So what you were laying out, I don't support. I think we just need to have regulations that are enforced, like we have put in, in what is now known as the Consumer Financial Protection Act. And I think that we will go back to prosperity. But let me say this. We were in a deep recession, one that equaled what we saw 73 years ago. And here in this area, it hasn't been as bad as it was in California, in Nevada, in Florida, in Michigan, in Ohio. Because you have the strength of the military base bliss where we have invested $3.2 billion in the last five years, according to Congressman Reyes and uh, General Casey, with whom we met last night. He's the Secretary of the Army, and we met with him last night, talked about you know, the situation that exists in Juarez and, and elsewhere. All of this to say, I believe that it was deeper and more difficult than anybody in the federal government realized, including members of Congress. And it's going to, it took 10 years to get into that mess. And it's going to take more than one year and a half to get out of it. So again, you ask me, do you give me your thoughts? Do you agree with what I'm saying that we get out of using banks and so forth? No, I don't agree with it. I think that there is a place for banks. I want to have a bank account. I want to be able to write a check or use my debit card. We improved the credit card system. You know that. We did that three years ago. Because a lot of our college students were using it to buy their books or whatever they were short on when they went to in, enroll to register. And I saw what was happening to our families and our students. And we were inundated by lobbyists by the credit, from the credit unions saying, no, 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 everything is okay. Everything is okay. I said, heck no, it's not okay. I am an original co-sponsor of the bill that is going to reform the credit card system so that you don't do what you're doing now. And I'm not going to go into those details because you know them better than almost anybody outside of El Paso. So the point is, we, are, we, 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 we have reformed the banking system, we have reformed the credit card system, and we're working on home mortgage uh, broker, brokers and the regulations that will, that will govern them. So it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. We will go back to the period of the 1990s where we had the longest period of prosperity, wartime or peacetime. And we can get back to that. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be with you.